Well, hey, everybody, good to have you in service with us today. Big God bless you. We are in part number one of a three-part message series that we've entitled Relationship Goals. We're going to have a lot of fun in this series, and I'll tell you a lot more about that in just a second. But as always, want to first of all say a big hello to our church on line family, people coming to us from all over America and around the world. And I want to give a big shout out to all the men and women in 109 Department of Corrections. Come on, everybody. Would you give them the biggest, biggest, come on, warm welcome. Glad you're with us today in service. God bless you. Well, hey, I want to jump right into today. And I actually want to give you what I believe is the most powerful verse, I believe, in the entire Bible for husbands, where the Bible says that we as husbands, we're supposed to love and honor, and we're supposed to even give our lives for our wives, just like Christ has done for the church. That's what the Bible says. That's what the Bible, what the Bible preaches. And we're going to do that in this, in this series, and especially in this message today. In fact, in preparation for this message, I did probably one of the most self uh, selfless, sacrificial things that a husband can possibly do. I went ahead and I watched with Tatum the movie Pride and Prejudice. The chickest chick flick of all time right there, baby. Incredibly sacrificial. It's incredibly. I mean, the moral of the movie is this, that honestly, it doesn't really matter what you do as a guy. If you're a gazillionaire and you are a man, you're going to get the girl. Maybe not really, but that's kind of what I walked away with from watch, watching the movie. <laughs> and, and, you know, the way that they, uh, they talk about relationships in, in that movie, it, it's set back in the Renaissance period, and there's, there's attraction and conflict and arguing, uh, reconciliation, all kinds of things. A lot of the th same things that we, we experience in our culture here today, and it really begs the question, what is up? With relationships, what's up with them? Well, you need to know this, that relationships were God's idea. In fact, I want you to see what Jesus said in the book of Matthew. He's actually quoting the Old Testament. He says this, a man will leave his father and mother and be united with his wife, and the two will become what? One flesh. So that they are no longer two, but now they are one. Therefore, what God has joined together, let not man separate. And today, I want to actually talk to us about how do you find the one? How do you find it? Now, before we go there, let me ask a question. How many married couples in the house? Come on, you're a married couple, hands up. Those of you in the correctional facilities online, okay, great. You can put your hands down. How many of you are not married? Okay, hands up. Look at this, all over the house here. Crazy. That's awesome. Okay, let me ask this. How many of you are single and you're looking for the one? Come on, put your hand up. Keep, keep it up. You may want to look around, okay? <laughs> let me ask another question. How, how many of you, you you're, you're married, you, you found the one, but it's, it's been a few years, and you're, you'd like to trade the one in for another one? Come on. But don't, don't you lift your hands. <laughs> I see that hand back there. You can be saved in Jesus' mighty name. <laughs> oh. Yeah. Um, lot, 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 lots happening in our culture when it comes to relationships. In fact, I absolutely love when I see, you know, uh, a couple that come together and they fall in love. And, you know, the girl always comes running in. She's like, oh, 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 oh. I, I found, he's incredible. He's amazing. Oh, I think I found the one. Now, what's amazing to me is how quickly the one can turn into the one that drives you crazy. You think you found Mr. Perfect, and six months later, you're filing a restraining order against Mr. Perfect. And it happens all the time, all the time. So for example, uh, there, there, let's just say a girl, she's, she's like, she found, finds Mr. Perfect. Mr. Perfect. So she tells her best friend, 
She's like, oh, I went on a date with him with a bunch of other friends, and he was so cute, so cute. And so we went out with all these friends, and he's telling all these jokes, and nobody's laughing. Nobody's laughing. And then during the dinner, he, he let out this cute little burp. It was the most adorable sound I've ever heard in my whole life. And then we went back to his apartment there, and there's stuff everywhere. Clothes are everywhere. He's the biggest mess. He needs me. We are perfect for each other. Well, y'all know where I'm going with this. Fast forward, the two of them, they get married a year down the road. I am so sick and tired of you. Sick and tired of you. Your jokes stink. Nobody thinks they're funny. You're not funny. None. You embarrass me. Everywhere you go, you embarrass me. You're so lazy. You just sit around the house and you burp and you fart all day long. And it's just, and then everything is messy. Everywhere you go, just mess, 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 mess. How is it that somebody can go from the one to the one that drives you crazy? And really right now, it it begs the question, how in the world do you find the one? Well, I want you to jot this statement down if you're taking notes. To be really fulfilled in life, you have to find the one, which really raises the question, how do you even know that you found the one? Because there are so many people that I know that are looking for the one. They're just looking. How, how, how do I know? And, and really, you have to acknowledge this, that people are getting married later in life with more reservations and less success. So all kinds of people are still wanting to get married, but they're holding off. Why? Because they've been burned. They're testing the waters. They're wanting to make sure that everything is perfectly spot on right. And so they're still wanting to get married. The, the, the problem is, and we've got to acknowledge this, that they do get married later on in life, but the, sec- the success isn't all that great. So what do we do about all this? Well, let me say this. Uh, <laughs> I know I made fun of the movie Pride and Prejudice, all right? Maybe one of the worst movies ever made. <laughs> but I think that that's my role as a male to make fun of the Hallmark Channel and chick flicks, all right? <laughs> But the movie has some interesting things when it relates to relationships, interesting concepts. In fact, it's set back in the Renaissance period, really in in a time that is different than today. Because what you would need to know is that historically, we are in in the third phase of dating, third phase. So Pride and Prejudice uh, was set back in a time when, let me just say it like this, it was the first phase and it's called courtship. And this has actually lasted for most all of human history. Uh, In fact, right now, most of the world still practices courtship. And this is when the males, uh, this is when the female side of the family would pursue the male. And there was, I mean, this is where you get dowries and land and sheep and and all that stuff. And a lot of the world still today practices this. In fact, most of all of human history um, this is how things have been done since, since the very beginning. Well, it was about 100 years ago now with the invention of the automobile that we stepped into another pathway. And it's what we call, what we're familiar with, it's called dating. And this was on the guy's end of things. And this is where the guy would show up to the girl's house and, and he would pick her up and they would go travel in, in the car, get away from the house. And that's when a lot of bad things happened. Okay. <laughs> The dating. Well, we are no longer in courtship. We're no longer in the dating phase. We've gone to the third phase, and that's what's called hooking up. And this has actually become the most common pathway in culture today. I'm just going to hook up, hook up. Um, So um, if I'm lonely, I'm going to swipe right. I'm, I'm going to find somebody to Netflix and chill with. And I'm going to tell you, Netflix and chill, if you think it means just watching some movies together, that's not what it means. In fact, if you don't know what it means, don't say it. In fact, if you're over 50, (laughs) Google it. 
It's really easy to understand, <laughs> but, but Google it. Let me give you another word. Uh, it's called the one night stand. So no longer are relationships anymore in our culture primarily about commitment and relationship. It's all about sex. And what makes it really difficult if you're trying to live godly is to try to find somebody else who is also trying to live godly in this culture that's trying to do things for the right reasons. Which really begs the question, then what do we do with all of this? What choice do we have to make? Well, there's a group of people that come along and just say, well, this is just the culture that we live in right now. It, and it's not that bad. And I'm just gonna challenge that today, and I'm gonna tell you, that if you're gonna take the normal road that everybody takes, you're gonna get the normal results. You're gonna get the, the same destination that everybody is experiencing. You're gonna, you're gonna experience that. I truly believe that God has a better, higher plan for your relationship. He really does. And I am going to lead you in a journey today down a pathway that is going to be completely opposite to everything that you get in the world. And I'm going to give it to you today without apology. Out, without apology. Because God has something better for you. He really does. And some of you are going to be looking at me today like a cow staring at a new gate. But I'm going to tell you. Because <laughs> it's different. Listen, if you do the normal things, you're going to get the normal destination. You're going to get the normal results. And you're not normal. God's not promised you a normal relationship. He's called you to be different, to stand out, to excel, to be distinguished in the middle of a culture that is all trying to blend in. Hallelujah. So let's do this today. In fact, I, I, I want you to, to hear this again, that to be really fulfilled in life, you have to find the one. And I want to build on that thought, and we're going to build on that in the weeks to come. In fact, let me just say, next week, uh, may, possibly even the next two weeks, are going to be very PG-13, like the upper end of PG-13, okay? So if you have children that you do not want in service, I would encourage you to take advantage of our amazing children's ministry that we have here uh, at the church. You will thank me for that. But today, I want to talk to us about the spiritual side of relationships. And so, one day, there was a religious leader of the law, a Pharisee, that came to Jesus, and he basically gave him a very pro provocative question. He tried to trick him, tried to trap him. He asked him the question. He said, out of all the laws of God, what's the most important and Jesus responded back and said this. He said, love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul, with all your mind. This is the what? The first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it. And that's what? That we're supposed to love our neighbor. How? As ourselves. Listen, why are so many marriages screwed up today? I think it's because, by and large, we don't have an appreciation for how God made us. So we, you know, this is the common way that people connect. They're like, oh, oh I just, I got to find somebody that completes me. I, I got to find the one. I got I, 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 I to connect. I got I to gotta hook up with somebody. I got, I'm, I'm on the hunt. I'm on the look. I've got to find somebody. Hey, everyone, for just once. I would love to see a godly young man and a godly young woman that a young godly man comes running in going, hey, everybody, check this out. I met the most amazing girl ever. She loves Jesus. She looks good and smells good too. <laughs> I think I found the two. I found my two. I, I, found, I found my two. In fact, let me say it like this. Jesus is the one, and your spouse needs to be the two. Because I'm telling you that to literally be fulfilled in your relationship, to literally be fulfilled in your marriage, Jesus has to be the one, and your spouse has to be the two. In fact, check this out. Pursuing marriage more than pursuing God is idolatry. In fact, let me get it. Intentionally, I'm going to make things very uncomfortable in this room. 
for just the next few moments, okay? Because this not only applies to those that are married, this applies to those who are not married. So we have so many amazing ladies that are watching our services that are engaged in church. Like you ladies, are, you're amazing. Amazing. But some of you, some of you are what I call gotta have a guy girl. I'm a gotta have a guy girl. Just gotta have a guy. And if you don't ever have a guy, I'm gonna do whatever it takes to get a guy. So you're never comfortable. You're never satisfied. In the waiting season, gotta have a guy girl. And so if there's ever a moment in your life that maybe there's no guy in your life, the first guy that comes walking along on your pathway there, you're, I name him and claim him in Jesus' mighty name. And guys, you're the same. God, there's so many guys like, man, I need a girl in my life. If I don't have a girl, I'm, I'm bored. I got to have a girl in my life, you know, so I got something to do on Friday nights. And so you settle. Instead of waiting for the right person that God brings your way, it's, I mean, the, the first, you settle for any old person that comes, that comes your way. And I'm just going to tell you that when you seek anything more than above God, that is an idol. It's an idol, and we need to be aware of that. In fact, the Bible says, look at this, I want you to examine this, in Exodus, it says, do not, what? Do not worship any other God, for the Lord, whose name is Jealous, is a what kind of God? He's a jealous kind of God. In fact, let me take a second and talk to our married folk that are here today, that are listening, watching online. So it's really easy for, for a lot of married folk to convince people that everything is great in your marriage. It's really easy. But deep down on the inside, there are those that are listening to, to me today that you know that your marriage is not where it's supposed to be. And any time that your marriage gets to a place that it's not supposed to be, you'll actually begin to look to your spouse for things that they were never designed to give you. you. You'll begin to expect them to meet needs in your life that they were never designed by God to meet in your life. So it goes a little something like this. It always starts off with, you know, I gotta find, I gotta find, gotta find the one, gotta, fi gotta find the one, gotta, gotta find somebody that completes me. And the minute that you do, boom, instant goosebumps everywhere. Every love song on the radio now makes sense. A couple years later, you guys get married, and all of a sudden, you just begin to realize, you're not meeting my needs. Now we find this disconnect, and now there's arguing and contention and bitterness and all these other things get in the middle. Well, what has happened? What had happened is this. You were looking for the one, and God never called them to be the one of your life. He's always supposed to be the one of your life. And, when, and listen, the order is important. It really is. I'm telling you, guys, listen up. A godly woman is an incredible thing. I'm going to say it over here. <laughs> a godly woman is an incredible thing, guys. Amen. There we go. Over this side. Hey, guys over here. A godly woman is an incredible thing. I'm telling you, an ungodly woman will mess your life up. She will screw your life over. I mean, it's bad. An ungodly woman. But in a godly woman, guys like me, we don't, I, don't, I don't deserve a godly woman like I've got. We just don't. And I'm telling you, everybody, uh, God made women amazingly. You, listen, ladies, you are amazing. Amazing. God made you to be multipliers. Everything you touch multiplies. It's like this gift that God has given you that God did not give to men, but he gave it to you. There's something that's on the inside of you. Tatum is a multiplier. I give her a house. She bippity boppity boo. She turns it into a home. I mean, like a place where I want to relax. It's a refuge. I give Tatum money for groceries, bippity boppity boo. She turns it into pillows.
<laughs> no, I'm just kidding. She goes out and she brings back all these groceries and she creates a meal fit for a king. Man, I give Tatum some love. Bippity bobbity boo. She turns it into two kids. <laughs> I'm telling you, women are multipliers. You're amazing. You're unbelievable. And that's where I need to say this to all the guys. Listen, guys, if you give her a hard time, she's going to bibbity bobbity boo she's going she's gonna to release hell on you in Jesus. <laughs> Women are amazing. They're multipliers. So let me ask this question. Guys, if you don't like what you've been getting, check up on what you've been giving. I'm going to say that again. Yeah. Guys, if you don't like what you've been getting, check up on what you've been giving. And all the ladies say, Pastor, Brother Chris, preach it, brother. <laughs> now, ladies, hold on. I'm coming after you in a second, all right? <laughs> but let me just say this. Bottom line about relationships, I really believe that we have bought into a standard that is way beneath what God has always intended. Way beneath. Uh, because we have this dream that, hey, I'm going to find, you know, my, my spouse, and we're going to get married, and we're going to get a car and, and a house, and we'll get some kids, and we'll get a dog, never a cat, but we're going we're to get a dog. And we're going we're gonna to live by the golden rule in our marriage. Because the golden rule is the daily rule. Do unto others as they would have you do unto to you. And so I'm going to bring my part and you're going to bring your part. I'm going to give 50% and you're going to give 50%. And the 50-50 and the is going to make 100. We're going to make a whole. And you need to know that when Jesus was teaching about the golden rule, do unto others as you would have them do unto you, he was never talking about marriage. He was actually talking about sibling relationships. He was actually giving some instruction for how brothers and sisters, how to, to, to react and to treat each other. No, I'm telling you that the marriage relationship is supposed to go to a whole nother place. It's not 50-50. It's supposed to be 100%, 100%. You could, for, for example, you could say, do unto your spouse just like Jesus has done unto you. And Jesus didn't just give you 50%. He gave you 100%. He gave you everything. In fact, the verse that I started off this message with, I said that husbands are supposed to love and serve their wives, even to the point of giving their lives for their wives, just as Christ has done for the church. That's not 50-50. That's 100%. 100%. 100%. In fact, I want to show you this here again, this verse out of, um, out of Exodus it says this in the New Living Translation. It says, you must worship no other gods but only the Lord, for, for he is a God who is what? Passionate about his relationship with you. So let me ask you, what excites the heart of God? You do. What does God want more than anything else? A relationship with you. You. And any time that you try to find, any time that you put a relationship above your relationship with God, you, you'll never experience the best that that relationship has to offer. You will always be experiencing something subpar because God, and you'll always find yourself becoming frustrated with that person because you're going to be trying to find something to gain out of them that they were never designed to give you. And I experienced this firsthand. Uh, Tatum and I, we have, uh, have been married coming up in May for 23 years. And I'm not going to bore you with all the details of, 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 how, you know, of how we got married and all that. But I'm going to tell you, it's been an incredible journey. But I will say this. I grew up in the 80s and 90s, early 90s. This was the dating era. Y'all remember that? Everybody was dating everybody. Everyone had the letterman jackets, and so all the girls would wear the guys' letterman jackets. And unfortunately for me, it led to some, um, uh, to some promiscuity. It led to some very bad relationships. 
And see, the enemy is, he promises you all this excitement and all this, but what he actually does is he turns it around and he bites you in the rear with it and destroys your life. And so very quickly, my life went to a place that I was alone, I was hurting, I was battling on the inside. Depression, one of the deepest, darkest places. I was absolutely miserable, and it was in that moment that I hit rock bottom that the Lord put his mighty hand down into that mud pit of where I was at, and he pulled me out. I encountered Jesus, and he changed my life. So right after that, I, went, I knew that God was calling me into the ministry, and so I went off to Bible college. And I was so determined to fulfill the call of God on my life that I was determined I was not going to let it be bridal college for me. It was going to be Bible college. So I didn't date a single person for all those years. So I finished up with Bible college, and I'm chomping at the bit to get into ministry. And unfortunately, the, uh, the, the culture in which I was raised in, there was an expectation that as a pastor that I would be married because if I was going to be a youth pastor, it, you, you gain a lot more credibility with the parents when you have a wife alongside you. So I went on the hunt <laughs> with everything on the inside of me. I pursued like passionately and I had crash and burn, crash and burn, crash and burn. I mean, it was brutal how many failed relationships that I went through. And I'll never forget, I got to a point that I just said, God, I'm so done with this. And instead of doing this anymore, instead of seeking my wife, I'm going to seek you. I'm going to seek the one. And I know, Lord, that as I seek you, you're going to bring my number two. You're going to bring my wife into my life. God is my witness. Two months later, I walk into a service on a Sunday night. How many of y'all remember it? We used to have Sunday night church every single Sunday night back in the day. I walked into a service on a Sunday night, and there in my dad's church was the most beautiful. I, I, I'd never seen a girl like this before. I mean, and here she was. I'm, I'm seeing her from across the auditorium, her hands lifted, worshiping God. And I thought, who in the world is that? So I found out. They said, oh, her name is Tatum. So I wrote her a note that night. Yeah, I wrote her a note. We didn't have phones back then. That was a long time ago. <laughs> so I wrote her a note. I said, hey, would you, like to go, would you like to go on a date with me? She said, yes. So I picked her up. The two of us went on, on a date. And she was pretty quiet. She was pretty shy. She didn't say much that night. And I kept thinking, man, she... My dad's the pastor of the church, and that's where she was attending. So I kept thinking, man, she just thinks I'm the preacher boy. Baby, I ain't no preacher boy. I'm the lover boy. <laughs> that's what's going on here. You got me all wrong. <laughs> and so we finished up the night, and I dropped her off. And so the very next day, I called her up again. I said, hey, um, you want to go on another date? She told me no. Imagine what my face looked like. When she said no. Well, I wasn't going to have it. I wore, I wore that girl down. For the next three weeks, three times a week, I would call her up and ask her to go on a date. She finally said yes. And on our second date, it was magical. In fact, she wrote in her journal that night, I think Chris is the man that I'm supposed to marry. Second date. So we spent the next eight months getting to, to know each other, becoming very good friends. I got to know her family really good. In fact, I brought a picture with me today of when Tatum and I were dating like 24, 25 years ago. <laughs> we were young little whippersnappers back then. <laughs> uh, I remember one day in prayer that the Lord spoke to me. He said, Chris, he said, Tatum carries your same values. She has a call of God on her life. She would be somebody that you could be very happy with for the rest of your life. And then I heard him whisper, I'm in this. And I just knew it. I had a piece in my heart that I was supposed to ask her uh, to be my wife. And so I went to her, her dad, who is six foot seven, a former police officer. Before he got saved, he was a tough guy. And I remember how nervous I was when I asked him if I could marry his daughter, and he said yes. And so there was a night, uh, 400 people, I had no idea who they even were. I got down on my knee, and I asked Tatum to be my, my wife, and I'm thankful that she said yes, because how many of y'all know that would have been embarrassing? <laughs> <laughs> 
And I tell her all the time, I, I say, baby, you are literally my godsend. My godsend. Because I didn't go looking for you. God brought you to me. God, 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 God brought me my angel. And really, she, she is my angel. She is. I mean, she's the closest thing to an angel on this earth. And God gave her. And I'm just going to tell you, being married to an angel is not easy. You know, you, you got that halo that glows at night. And you got those wings that are flapping in the face. And... But Tatum, I know you're not in this service right now, but I want you to know this, honey. I think that you are the most amazing person that is on this planet. And I want you to know that I am so thankful that God chose to send you into my life. And I love you with all of my heart. All of my heart. And I would just encourage every single young person that's, that's here. They ask me, like, how, how, do, how, do I, how, do I, how do I do this? Find the one. Find the one. And God will bring you your two. Find the one. Um, in fact, I want to see you, uh, I want you to see this verse here. It says in, in Matthew, it says, but seek first his kingdom and his righteousness and all these things will be given to you as well. Listen, he's got to be the one. Without him being the one, you'll never find fulfillment and meaning in your marriage like you were always intended to have. And what has happened, so let me say like this. The reason why Tatum and I have a great marriage is because she's not my one. Jesus is. She's my two. And I'm thankful that I'm not her one. Jesus is. I'm her two. In fact, let me show you this here. Uh, this is a great illustration. Maybe you've seen this before. You know, in every marriage, God needs to be in the middle of it. So there's a husband and a wife, and there's God. And here's what I want you to notice. When the two of you get closer to God, notice what happens. You get closer to each other. You really do. See, the devil comes along, and he tries to deceive you and lies and says, ah, oh, you don't need God in your life. Just distance yourself from God. Let's do things the world's way. And if you do it that way, you get farther away from God. Here's what happens. You actually fall into a trap. You actually get farther apart from each other. Farther apart. He needs to be the one. Your spouse needs to be the two. Period. Period. So let me just say this because I know that we've got a, a, a lot of folks that are listening today that you're looking for your number two. And so let me, let, let, let me, let me, answer this question. How do you know when you've met the two? Okay. Good question. Wish I had a formula for you to give to you, but I don't. All right. But I can give you some suggestions as you're looking for your two. Here's the first one, and that's this. You both should be in love with Jesus more than anything else. Like he needs to be the rock on which your relationship is built. Period. He really does. Number two, you should, uh, you should be attracted to that person. Hey, everyone, I am tired of this over-spiritualized garbage that I've heard for so long. Well, I, at least he's a godly guy, and he can at least cook. And maybe if I pray for a long time, I'll actually start being attracted to him. Listen, I make no apologies when I tell you today. I believe God wants to give you somebody that you're actually genuinely attracted to. And everybody, come on, say amen. amen. Really? I'm telling you, that's how Tatum and I are. That girl is always wanting to make out with me. Always. <laughs> like over and over and over. And I just, you know, I can hold her off for a while. I tell her, I say, baby, I am not some piece of meat. I got feelings. I got emotions, you know. But you know how women are, man. They'll just wear you out. Finally, you know, you just kind of, you know, you have to give in and minister to her needs and everything. And, but that's what just a good husband does. Come on. I really believe that, that God wants to give you somebody that you're actually attracted to. Number three, you should be, uh, 
they, they should be your best friend. In other words, do you love being with them? Can I tell you, my wife Tatum is my best friend. We've been together now for 25, coming up on 25 years, dating and uh, being married. She's my best friend. Every day I get to be with Tatum is a good day. It's a good day. And here's the fourth thing, and that's this. Can we serve God better together married than we could apart? And if the answer is yes, gentlemen, save up. Pay cash for your ring. Get down on your knees and say the very same thing that I said to Tatum. I said, Tatum, come glorify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name together. Let's do it. Amen, everybody? Amen. 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 Come on, why don't you bow your heads. Close your eyes all across this place. What's the Lord speaking to you today about in this message? You know, maybe for some of you, you've been, you've been, you got the order wrong. You, you've been pursuing that relationship more than you've been pursuing God, and it's become an idol. Maybe for some of you, you've, you're in those pathways of dating, and maybe you've, you're in that third one, and you're just... It's just hooking up. You feel just depleted and empty and dead on the inside. Maybe you've got a marriage today that you found the two of you drifting away from the things of God and you just go, oh my goodness, God gave me a wake up call why we are so distant to each other. Because we need to get both back closer to Him. Because when we do, oh, we get His character, His love, His peace, His direction. What's God speaking to you about today? It's time that we finally surrender to the Lord. For some of you, you're, you're single and you're looking. And maybe, just maybe for you, you've been experiencing crash and burn, crash and burn, broken relationships, and it's been disastrous. And it's time that you finally just say, Jesus, I'm going to seek you first, and I'm going to trust that you're going to bring the right person into my life because I'm going to make you my one while I wait for my number two. So Lord, I just pray for every person that's listening today. Touch our hearts. We want to live a life that pleases you. We want to live a life, Lord, where you are the God that is jealous for us. You're the God that is passionate about a relationship with us. And so Lord, we, we put you first. Touch our hearts, I pray. Come on, right where you're at. Just release that thing to God. Just give it to God right now. Just give it to Him. And with heads bowed and eyes closed, maybe you're here today and you are away from Jesus. And you felt the draw of the Lord all throughout worship. And you know that you're not in a right relationship with Him. Today's your day. Tomorrow's not guaranteed to any one of us. Life is short. So right where you're at, if you would like to give your heart to, to the Lord, which I believe is the greatest decision that you'll ever make in your entire life, right where you're at, just surrender to the Lord and just say these words to Him. Just say, Jesus, I give you my life. I give you my sin, my mistakes, my mess-ups. And I ask for the, for, the for the forgiving power and grace of God to flow over my, my heart and my life. I confess with my mouth and I believe in my heart that Jesus is the Son of God. I thank you for hearing my prayer today. In Jesus' strong name I ask. And all God's people in the house, come on, say amen. And amen. Here's what I know people all across this auditorium, those online, those in correctional facilities. You just made a decision for the Lord. And if, if you're able, I'm going to ask you to text Fresh Start to this number that we have right here so we can send you some information. And we just want you to know that we are so honored to, to be able to walk hand in hand with you together. And praise God for, for that. And I want you to be reminded, everybody, that tomorrow we kick off 
revival nights. It's going to be incredible. And so if you know teenagers, get them here. One of the things I would always do when I was in student ministry, sometimes students are like a little apprehensive. They're like, well, I don't know anybody. Great. Bring a friend. We'll pay for food. I would, I would do that all the time. Hey, br- br- I would tell parents, tell your kid, bring two or three other friends, let them go to service, and then we'll take you out to pizza afterwards. Or we'll take you out to grab some, some burgers or, or something. Or get some Christian chicken at Chick-fil-A. <laughs> uh, or something like that. And it's amazing that if you feed them, they will come. <laughs> they, they will. And let's pray and believe that God is going to absolutely encounter our students in a way that they've never encountered before. There's literally going to be hundreds and hundreds of teenagers packed into this auditorium, and God's going to show up in a mighty way. And so be praying, be bringing, let's let's expect great things. Amen? Come on, everyone, why don't you stand to your feet? Prayer teams are here. We'd love the opportunity to pray with you. Ways to give are on the screen. Let me bless you today as you give. Lord, bless you and keep you. Lord, make His great face to shine upon you be gracious to you. In Jesus' mighty name I pray. Amen and amen. Love you everybody. God bless you. You're dismissed.